And welcome to this panel after the coffee break. My name is Guntram Wolf and I'm the director of Brügel and I'm delighted uh, to chair uh, this panel on the important topic of risk sharing in Europe's monetary uh, union. How can we achieve more risk sharing through financial markets? Um, so let me thank the National Bank of uh, Belgium, uh, the European Central Bank, the Solvay, um, and Toulouse uh, universities for um, putting this together and for giving me, me this spot. Now, of course, um, we have a problem here. The problem is that we have five excellent speakers that all could talk for one and a half hours uh, on, on, their, on their own about this topic. Um, but we have to share um, our time. So. Um, I will be very strict in the timekeeping. Uh, we have three times 20 minutes presentations, and really 20 minutes. Um, and then we have uh, two uh, discussants, uh, Laurence Boone and uh, Paul de Grauwe, who will have uh, 10 minutes each. And then we will have a little bit of time uh, to discuss among ourselves and, of course, also with uh, the audience. So if you have good questions, uh, please note them down and, uh, and, um, and ask them at the end. Perhaps a few thoughts um, uh, to, to get, us, get us going. Um, I think when, when talking of risk sharing in Europe's monetary union, I think many of us um, have the statistic in mind that in the United States, um, risk sharing through financial markets actually plays a very important role in smoothing income and consumption across US states. Um, and uh, I think many in the room certainly agree that it would be desirable um, to have similar kind of mechanisms in the, in the euro area. And there is an important discourse that sees this really as a substitute uh, for fiscal risk sharing. So the idea is we create uh, financial risk sharing mechanisms and by doing that um, uh, we can actually in the end do less uh, fiscal risk sharing. Um, but the reality is, um, and the question is, um, whether capital markets union and banking union, which are the two projects um, trying to uh, improve um, uh, cross-border ownership, um, trying to increase cross-border ownership in equities, in credit markets, in bond markets, that would allow us to do more risk sharing, whether those uh, two projects uh, actually achieve, um, achieve that aim. Unfortunately, so far, the numbers don't look very good. Um, if you look at banking union, um, banking union has not increased cross-border bank mergers. Um, on the contrary, uh, banks have become more national in the last 10 years, not uh, uh, more exposed to, uh, to credit risk elsewhere. The sovereign bond holdings um, on banks' balance sheets tended to increase um, in some countries, at least, uh, of the Eurozone, and it's typically the sovereign bonds of the country in which that bank is located. So the home bias um, hasn't really gone down in, in banking. And when we look at the, the, the project of Capital Markets Union, um, I think an, an honest uh, look is that um, the European Commission has put out a, a whole lot of um, proposals, legislative proposals, on how a Capital Market Union could be advanced, could be uh, uh, implemented. But the reality is many legislative proposals basically are stuck uh, in, the, in the council and are not really moving uh, forward. And um, if you look at the actual equity markets and, and bond markets, you will still continue to see a very, very uh, 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 strong home bias. So risk sharing um, through financial markets, equity markets, also hasn't much increased in the last 10 years. So, so I guess the question is, um, and, um, and to, to provoke a bit the debate, is um, uh, if, we, if, we don't, uh, if we don't make, uh, how, can we, how can we get the private sector to, to really do more risk sharing cross borders if the public sector itself is actually quite reluctant to do so? In other words, how can we ask banks, households, companies to do risk sharing cross border if we as, um, government representatives, uh, and so, some here are, I guess, government representatives, um, consider actually uh, sharing risks as too risky for, for the taxpayer. So I guess what I'm saying here is perhaps we should ask the question whether instead of uh, seeing banking and capital markets union as uh, 
a substitute uh, for um, fiscal union, we should see it as a complement. So in other words, we need some fiscal risk sharing in order to be able to advance on private capital market and banking, banking um, risk sharing. And, um, and I guess if, if we don't achieve that, I think there's many questions that uh, we should be, uh, should be reflecting on what it means for monetary union. If we don't achieve um, fiscal risk sharing and we don't achieve capital and banking risk sharing, what does it mean for Europe's monetary union? So these are some of the questions I think we, we want to discuss today and want to uh, uh, dwell into in some depth. And I think we have an excellent panel of, of speakers and the first speaker uh, will be Emmanuel uh, Farhi, a professor at Harvard University, who has written, I think, a couple of papers on, on the topic. And please, Emmanuel, you will have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to participate uh, in this panel. And uh, I'm going to be talking about resharing in monetary unions. Resharing is desirable in general. Uh, the question is whether this process is hampered by various uh, externalities and market failures. And if so, what sorts of policy interventions these market failures justify. Another question you can ask is whether these concerns are uh, true in general, valid in general, or whether they apply specifically in monetary union. And finally, uh, is good risk sharing indispensable, or can we make do with other instruments? So these are the questions that I'm going to try to tackle uh, in this talk. I will start by uh, very quickly laying down some general principles. And then uh, I will work out the implications of these principles for a specific example of what I will call Mundelian risk sharing, uh, which is basically the interdependence of risk sharing and macroeconomic stabilization in monetary unions. I'll refer you to this uh, 7 plus 7 reports, of which I'm a co-author together uh, with Beatrice, for a broad set of more specific proposals that are inspired by similar principles. Uh, to think about budget rules, euro bonds, doom loops, banking unions, financial markets union, fiscal unions, etc. So economists have identified a number of macroeconomic externalities, and I've listed three here, uh, which has the, uh, the three main ones that are discussed. And you can see the, the technical concept, aggregate demand externality, pecuniary externality, fiscal externalities, and in parentheses, their real world manifestations. So aggregate demand externalities are about uh, Keynesian economics, about output gaps, about recessions. Pecuniary externalities are about illiquidity, fire sales, systemic runs. Fiscal externalities are about bailouts, doom loops, monetization of deficits. These externalities give rise to a, a, a form of market failure in risk sharing, okay? in the sense that privately optimal risk sharing is not going to be socially optimal. There's a failure of the welfare theorems. The invisible hand is going to break down. There's going to be a greater value, uh, social value of risk sharing compared to the private value of risk sharing. Uh, and uh, that will manifest itself by greater social risk aversion compared to private risk aversion. And a desirability for more insurance than private participants would secure on their own. So laissez-faire is going to be suboptimal because of these externalities, because of these market failures. And these externalities, these market failures, and hence the need for intervention, is going to be more prevalent in monetary unions. So now I'm going to shift to the more specific part of my presentation. I'm going to zoom in on these aggregate demand externalities, on Keynesian effects. And you have to bear in mind that general, uh, similar principles apply to uh, other uh, externalities. So I'll call this the resharing implications of Mundell. Uh, it builds on a paper that I have with my co-author, Ivan Werning, which was published last year uh, in the American Economic Review. So to set the stage, imagine a monetary union. In a monetary union, you have fixed exchange rates. So countries lose uh, the tool of their independent monetary policy. There's one monetary policy uh, for the full union. Uh, there are normal rigidities, so prices or wages are sticky. And you have to consider a situation where you have asymmetric shocks. 
So the crisis is hitting Spain in a way that's not exactly the same as the, the way it's hitting Germany. Maybe it's more intense in Spain than in Germany and more intense in Greece than in France. That's a situation that cannot be uh, accommodated by union-wide monetary policy. You would need different monetary policies in different countries. You would need exchange rates to adjust, but they can't because you're in a monetary union. So that leads to imperfect macroeconomic stabilizations. Recessions are going to be worse in some countries uh, than in others. So we have to do something. And that's going to give rise to these aggregate demand externalities. Agents, when they contemplate risk sharing through financial markets, for example, they internalize the fact that if they secure more wealth or more income in a certain state of the world, they'll be richer and they'll be able to spend more. What they do not internalize is that by spending more, they're going to raise everybody's income and else everybody's spending and that that will have an effect on economic activity. Okay, so that's a market failure, an externality which is not internalized by private agents and uh, which is going to mean that the laissez-faire resharing, even if there were perfect, complete financial markets, would be inefficient. And there's a reason for the government to step in to correct uh, this market failure. It's also a justification for why you wouldn't see enough insurance, uh, even with complete markets. And importantly, these effects are going to manifest themselves only in monetary unions. If you're not in a monetary union, you have an independent monetary policy. You can let your exchange rate fluctuate to absorb uh, and to accommodate uh, the recession. So this is really what happens when you don't have monetary independence, you're in a monetary union. This triggers these aggregate demand externalities. This triggers a need for government intervention. This is a diagram that's meant to illustrate some of these notions. So the top diagram illustrates uh, private risk aversion and social risk aversion. So the, the upper curve, the green curve, is private risk aversion. This is the, the utility of wealth or the utility of income. And you see that the social utility of wealth or the social utility of income, the blue curve, is more concave. There's more social risk aversion than private risk aversion. Any given level of insurance will be more valuable socially than privately. An implication of this is that there's going to be a wedge between privately optimal and socially optimal risk sharing. And I wrote a formula here, and you should not uh, try too much to understand the symbols, but rather the concepts that are being conveyed. So the wedge is on the left-hand side, and it's the wedge for, uh, that characterizes the discrepancy between the value of transfers for country I and state S privately versus socially. And you see that it's a function of the need for more income, which is measured by the output gap. So if you have a country that's in a recession, there's a need for more risk sharing, more resources in that state of the world because that will stimulate the economy. And the second part is the effectiveness of this additional risk sharing. And that will depend on a number of parameters, like the openness of the country. So the more closed is the economy, the more efficient are going to be uh, these risk sharing transfers. The higher are the marginal propensities to consume, the, the more efficient are going to be these transfers because they're going to be spent more in the short run when they're needed, when the economy is in a slump. And when the shock is more persistent, because to some extent, uh, a transfer is kind of a permanent solution, so it's better suited uh, if the shock itself uh, is rather permanent. So now you can think uh, with this in mind about the process of completing markets in a monetary union. The first point that you learn from uh, the previous principles is that this process of completion of markets is more valuable socially than privately. Okay, and that's true, uh, uh, only true in a monetary union. Okay, so the, it's more valuable to complete markets in a monetary union, and even more so socially uh, than, uh, than privately. So that gives a rationale for government involvement in the completion of markets that's independently of the social good, uh, public good argument of, uh, of completing markets. The other lesson that you learn is that if you do laissez-faire resharing, you're going to have uh, insufficient resharing. It's not enough to let, if, imagine you complete markets perfectly and financial markets work uh, beautifully and smoothly, okay? then you're going to get perfect laissez-faire resharing, and that's not going to be enough resharing. Okay, the market by itself is not going to do the job, and we can do better than laissez-faire financial markets union. 
So how can we think about optimal resharing uh, in a monetary union? So you have to set up uh, a planning problem. So it's a bit uh, mechanism design means uh, Keynesian economics. And the thing that you have to uh, navigate is the dual role of resharing of international transfers. On the one hand, uh, it supports private resharing. And on the other hand, it's important for macroeconomic stabilization. Okay, when you secure more wealth or more income in a certain country for a given state of the world, you're going to stimulate aggregate demand in that state of the world. And so you're trying to reconcile uh, these two objectives to the best possible, and you get the solution, which is, you know, what optimal resharing uh, should look like. And there are different ways of implementing these solutions. So different institutional setup that could uh, support this optimal resharing. The first one is going to look like a fiscal union. So if you imagine that it's very difficult to share the kind of risk that we have in mind through financial markets, one thing you could do is to set up uh, a system of international transfers between governments, and the governments would pass through these transfers uh, to their citizens, and it would really have to be conceived as an insurance system, which means that you contribute in some states of the world and you receive uh, in other states of the world. If countries are very different, you can calibrate the system so that it's not unfair. Another way of implementing this arrangement is very different. There's no fiscal dimension, and you do it entirely through financial markets. For that, it's important to have financial markets that work very well. Ideally, you'd have complete financial markets, so you could possibly uh, share a lot of risk through financial markets. But then you need to intervene in the operation of these financial markets with macroprudential policies in order to elicit more resharing than a private agents would do by themselves. Okay? So uh, this is sort of showing you uh, what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, you have the effectiveness of international transfers as a function of two uh, characteristics. The persistence of the shock, that's on the x-axis, and the openness of the country, that's on the y-axis. So you see that uh, these, uh, either these fiscal unions or this financial union is going to do well for shocks that are relatively persistent and for economies that are relatively closed. On the right-hand side, you see the transfers that are uh, required to support uh, this arrangement. And so in net present value for a 5% shock to the terms of trade, we're talking about transfers of the order of 2% of GDP. This is what happens in a situation where you have a macroeconomic crisis but not a financial crisis. Okay? So in that case, marginal propensities to consumes are going to be relatively small. Agents are not going to be financially constrained. If agents are relatively financially constrained, that means that they're going to have high marginal propensities to consume. If you give them some money, they're going to spend a lot in the short run. And that's going to make this transfer effective even for transitory shocks because when the money arrives, it's going to be spent immediately instead of being smoothed over time. So in realistic situations that we worry about, where uh, you have a financial crisis that compounds uh, a macroeconomic crisis, you have high MPCs, and then you see that transfers do very well, basically, for economies that are not too open. This is a table that uh, shows you uh, the effectiveness of transfers either fiscal or through financial markets with macroprudential policy, compared to other more conventional instruments. So you can see this uh, as a horse race. And I've encircled uh, some important numbers. So you see that, uh, for example, in the transfers column, uh, there's a number that says 66%. So that says that in response to a, a permanent shock, if you do optimal resharing, it would get you 66% of the way towards the first best. So it does a pretty good job at stabilizing this economy. You can compare this to the amount of uh, stabilization that you would get using only national fiscal policies. For example, suppose that we only let deficits run. So we relax the budget rules. We let uh, countries run deficits when they have recessions. And you see that if you do that to the best extent possible, you only get 55% which is less than this 66%. Moreover, I should point out that these gains can be accumulated, which means that if you let countries run deficits, you get 55%. That leaves 45% to be bridged. Well, 66% of this 45% can be bridged with transfers. So this is what happened with permanent shocks. 
uh, you see the, how the picture looks for transitory shocks. And it looks a bit worse for transfers, which are now basically equal to, to deficits. And the reason is pretty clear. Deficits are going to be a good tool to smooth out transitory shocks, not such a good tool uh, to deal uh, with permanent shocks. So what's the bottom line here? That there are large gains from improving risk sharing, even more so than from using optimal national fiscal policy, and that these gains are present even if you have national fiscal policy. So optimal risk sharing is a big deal. It's not something that uh, we can just dispense with. And uh, uh, we cannot make do with uh, other instruments, in my opinion. Obviously, when you talk about insurance, uh, the issue of moral hazard comes up. And it can be very important. We know what it does. It mitigates these gains, but it's not going to eliminate them. The other thing that's important to realize is that the extent of more hazard is going to depend on the particular implementation. There's much more room for, for moral hazard if you go for a fiscal union than if you go for a financial markets union, because governments can misbehave uh, in a, a fiscal union. And in any case, you can put in place adequate uh, institutions to manage uh, these moral hazard concerns. Thank you. Well, wonderful. We saved actually five minutes. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> uh, that gives us more time for discussion. Mahmoud, you're the next. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation <coughs> and very happy to be here. Let me say that I think part of, uh, let me just start by saying some of what I, we just heard in the previous presentation, you will recognize it, but, but no equations, no formulas, and uh, some features will be similar. So I may not, I will try and economize my time on those issues. Let me tell you a little bit about what my talk is about today. It's about largely about private risk sharing. I will touch on the need for public risk sharing. And I want to say at the outset that none of what I'm talking about implies that there is not a need, A, for public risk sharing, and in particular, it does not imply a risk for, uh, uh, imply no need for ex post risk sharing. So I'm not going to talk about crisis management, bailouts, ESM assistance, etc. But all of this is in consistent with Europe having a very strong crisis management uh, facility. And as you probably know, the IMF has been very supportive of strengthening the ESM and its role. OK, so with those caveats, let me start by saying, as I said, mostly about private risk sharing, but I will touch on public risk sharing as well. Just start by what, what I have in mind about risk sharing. Uh, it's basically spreading the cost of negative shocks. And, la and consistent with the previous presentations, as Professor Fahi was talking about, it's about largely about asymmetric or idiosy idiosyncratic shocks to countries. And what this risk sharing can occur through is in a number of channels, fiscal cross-border fiscal transfers, that's public risk sharing. And in the private markets through capital markets, all kinds of financial market activity intermediation. I'll come back to the, I'll come on to the details of that. Labor income and remittances and through credit markets, in particular the role of banks, okay? So that's what I have in mind about private risk sharing in those channels. Uh, now, let me take you through the obvious basics, again covered by Professor Fahi earlier. The inner monetary union, all of these things take on a, an added importance because of the constraints on monetary policy and that may not always be right for a particular country. To be sure, I just want to show you a slide that shows what kind of real exchange rate adjustments you have in a monetary union. Uh, you can get some through inflation differentials, but it's minor. Now, just as an illustration, on the left-hand side, we've got some euro area real exchange rates, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And pretty obvious point that before the Euro 1998, 
there was a fair amount of real exchange rate adjustment because nominal exchange rates were moving. Afterwards, you get very little real exchange rate adjustments because the nominal is fixed. So what you get left with is just whatever the inflation differentials are. Now, there's an argument for monetary policy here, which I will not go into here because that's a separate discussion. On the right-hand side, you see just one example of France's bilateral real exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the UK and the US. And the monetary union essentially does not seem to change the picture of that real exchange rate adjustment. Okay? I could do this for any other euro area country. So this is purely for an illustration that the imbalances you see in a, in a monetary union can't always be adjusted through real exchange rates, because, and the only room for adjustment is the inflation differentials. <coughs> And that has important implications for, for what we're talking about. So let me start by asking how we measure the extent of cross-border risk sharing. And if you follow something that is reasonably standard in the literature of looking at shocks that are smoothed by any kind of transfers and shocks that are not. So you decompose asymmetric shocks uh, and look at what, what, how much of these, what extent these shocks are smoothed or not. Again, very usual, and this is not always fair. There are lots of limitations on this about comparing the US and the Euro area. You can see that the red line, the red, the red, part, the red part of the histogram, that's the amount of the shock that is not smooth. Okay? By definition, because there are fewer transfers and a less efficient or less integrated capital market, there is going to be less smoothing in Europe. Uh, fiscal transfers are almost absent in the euro area. You, you almost can't see them. They are reasonably substantial in the US, but they're not the primary part of what, what is the extent of smoothing, even in the US. Uh, there is a lot more f factor income and capital market smoothing that goes on in the U.S. states, but that doesn't happen to, uh, to anywhere near that extent in the euro area. Now, one caveat about capital markets, and this is the possibly the one question mark about whether these are the right comparisons. If you think about equity holdings, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, if you're a resident in a U.S. state and you have your, part of your savings in the equity market, by definition, you invest in a national equity market, so that's already diversified. In the euro area, you don't have these pan-European equity markets. You have national equity markets. So by, by definition, if you invest some of your savings in an equity market, it's not going to lead to smoothing. There are, of course, some issues about what kinds of equities you hold and so on. Uh, so, slide six, okay. Now, I, I said I was gonna talk mostly about private risk sharing, but let me talk about the need for public risk sharing before I go back to private risk sharing. Uh, there is, of course, with one monetary policy, a greater uh, burden on fiscal policy for stabilization. And again, referring to asymmetric shocks. And more public risk sharing, fiscal risk sharing here, would improve the monetary policy, monetary fiscal policy mix. It would allow monetary policy to be, or the economies of the euro area as a whole to not be overly dependent on monetary policy. It would also help pro-cyclical fiscal tightening when countries have limited fiscal space. And this is essentially a way for me to plug a proposal that the IMF has put out for the central fiscal capacity. And rather than take you through the details, I'll just show you what impact it could have. So on the left, you have what would happen in the event of a large shock. So the blue line is if you had a central fiscal capacity, you moderate that shock and without a central fiscal capacity is effectively what happened during the global financial crisis. Okay? You get a fairly large change in our drop in output. Uh, 
The right-hand side is a little bit more detail on how to construct this fund and how it would perform over time. Uh, essentially, you could build this fund up to about 2% of GDP with very modest contributions of about 0.35% of GDP from each member state. I won't go through the details, but there are a lot of, in the design of this, there's a lot of attention paid to moral hazard. Okay. Uh, it requires compliance with the rules, the SGP. It also requires countries to, countries would only receive when they are actually hit by a shock and performing below potential output. And there are various definitions of what the, what the trigger would be. So that's the role for public risk sharing. And I emphasize again that this is really the point I want to make, that while I'm talking about private risk sharing, I do not think that there is no need for public risk sharing. Euro, the euro area definitely needs public risk sharing. Let me return to private risk sharing. Uh, starting with what's happened to cross-border banking claims. And this is a point that was touched on before. What you see in the euro area post the 2008 crisis is a very significant decline in cross-border claims. So there's actually less risk sharing going on in terms of cross-border banking activity and cross-border banking claims. This, and it's not just a problem for the usual countries that were hit very severely by the crisis. You can see this breakdown for some of the other Germany, France, Netherlands, and Spain, and all of them exhibit a very similar pattern. So cross-border claims across the euro area are falling even for countries not particularly badly hit by the crisis, okay? Uh, so that's, that's a problem. The private risk sharing is actually declining. It's not even kind of improving from as we go through the economic recovery. This is a picture, I was going to call this slide fragmentation, but that's an overused word. But this is going through a fairly long period since 2003. And you look at the dispersion between in, within the euro area of, re, of just uh, bank lending margins, uh, margins for house purchases, and uh, the bond yields, government bond yields. This dispersion is still very, very substantial in the euro area. This is an indication that there is not sufficient private risk sharing, or what, a mirror image of what I showed you earlier, uh, and what Guntram was calling, talking about earlier. There's not enough bank consolidation or merger activity. There is still very, uh, banking is still a very national and a very segmented market. And this suggests that the euro area risk sharing is not actually improving. On the, in the private sector. Now the obvious messages for this are completing the banking union. Uh, I won't dwell on this. This is a very familiar topic to many of you. It's about uh, having a fiscal backstop, a public backstop for the SRF, completing the, uh, the, a common deposit insurance, which is the missing pillar in the banking union, uh, and a whole range of things that this would help with, which is under a broad title of ring fencing of liquidity and capital uh, for the common supervisor. Let me again look at private risk sharing on the other side. So now I'm going to move away a little bit just from uh, the banking union in the, in the policy sense of what needs to be done, but just looking at Asset holdings. Now, if you compare the euro area with the US, uh, it doesn't look very different in terms of what we typically look at home bias. The home bias in the euro area is a little bit higher than the, than the US, but it's not very, very different, okay? So this is in terms of holding domestic assets versus foreign assets, okay? Uh, the, but now if I look at some, I just look at a couple of, uh, for what data is available for, let me just call these professional investors. So here I'm looking at the insurance companies and their asset holdings and their, their home bias in some sense, okay? Very large part of their 
equities are held in 60% in equities and uh, about 40 or 50% in bonds of domestic issued equities and bonds. So even in the euro area, when you look at insurance companies, their asset holdings have a very significant home bias. It is a little bit different for the smaller countries, and I'm not showing you all the data because smaller countries have thinner markets and their, their professional investors here, insurance companies, will have a little bit more diversification. But for the large ones, there is very significant home bias. Okay. A very similar picture for pension fund assets in the euro area. Now, you can see the Home bias in the euro area versus non-euro area Europe, okay? Uh, still very significant. There are some differences here, uh, particularly in terms between debt and equity, but it's still very much geared towards home bias, even for this professional investor institutions, the pension funds. This is a slide to show you the composition of what household assets look like, again, going back to comparisons with the US. It, it is a mirror image in some sense, although I don't have a slide, that Europe is very bank dominated, okay, on the asset side. A very large proportion of bank, uh, household assets, sorry, are held in conventional bank deposits versus compare that with the US, which is a lot more diversified and a lot more holdings of assets outside the banking system. Or, now, this talks a little bit to issues about the capital market union, but more capital market activity itself, which would help risk sharing. Okay. Now, I want to kind of, before I go on to look, what I've been talking about so far <laughs> is risk sharing through financial markets and so on. I want to pose a question, supposing we had a, a, a perfect capital market union, whatever, however well we want, however we want to define that, and we had diversification of assets and none of the skews, uh, concentrated distributions that I showed you earlier. This is going back to the real sector, okay? So since the euro area, the, since the adoption of the euro started in 98, if you look at What's happened to private capital flows from Northern Europe? And here I'm looking at things like FDI, foreign direct investment between North and South. Quite a lot of foreign direct investment has gone East and not South, so to speak, within the Euro area. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out, it's not really to do about risk sharing, but it's to say, even if you had a very efficient capital market, there is no guarantee that private capital flows will go, will travel in the way that you might think you want to, to, re, to increase risk sharing. And this is about what attracts private capital flows. Eastern Europe has just been more, more attractive for a lot of foreign direct investment. I won't go into the reasons for that. It's to do with productivity, flexibility of markets, possibly lower wages, more competitive labor markets, et cetera, et cetera. This is kind of maybe another way to put it. This is the usual IMF plug for more structural reforms in, in the euro area, but I won't bore you with that now. <laughs> but, that's a, but that's an indication that even in a very efficient capital market, you may not get the amount of capital mobility within the euro area through private markets that, that you think because a lot of it is determined by real factors. Now, this is just a summary of what a capital market union uh, needs. It's, it's what I've just kind of summarized. And because I'm short of time, I won't dwell on this slide too much. But it's basically what I've said now. Uh, the capital market union, one or two points to highlight. There is more urgency post-Brexit because of the role of London will change and the role of capital markets in the EU 27 will change. London is a very, very major provider of capital market activity for the EU at present. It's a different subject. Uh, let me conclude because I'm running out of time. The euro area needs both public and more pri uh, private risk sharing. Completing banking and capital markets union would help in this direction. Uh, 
But risk sharing is not a panacea for deep-rooted st structural problems that give rise to competitiveness gaps within the euro area. And that was my slide that I was talking about on f looking at the pattern of foreign direct investment flows. Let me stop there and go into my hope I've kind of conformed to the time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, our third speaker is Beatrice Vidalimao. President CPR. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, managing financial crisis, where do we stand? It's a question we can ask uh, every, every year again. And um, in some ways, the answers over the last years have changed. In some ways, they remain the same. We still, um, we still stand in the place where we shouldn't be. And uh, what I want to, um, what I want to show us here is uh, the answers that we gave about a year ago, and then the debate that followed from that. I'll start from the question: What still needs solving? What are some of the priorities of what needs solving? Um, how to fix it? I'm taking the seven plus seven. Some of the seven plus seven uh, co-authors are here in the room as the starting point, and then I will focus on the debate. And uh, again, some of the people who have uh, contributed to this debate are in the room, and that should show the spectrum of the of the issues. I know that some of the sp later speakers in this conference will also uh, get back to similar issues. And then at the end, I want to raise a bit of a philosophical question is why is it so hard to agree? So what needs fixing? I mean, my two um, uh, previous speakers have actually done a great job, both theoretically and empirically. I, uh, to underline exactly these points, um, it needs fixing that for a monetary union, there is a, as an initial status, uh, we have very limited financial integration, so not very much private risk sharing and also a limited amount of uh, public risk sharing. And maybe even more importantly that these, uh, this amount of risk sharing declines in crisis. So the, so the, the insurance, um, the insurance properties that we promised that we wish from diversification are actually not there in the crisis that we have witnessed when safe haven flows and other amplification method, uh, mechanisms, in particularly through the bank sovereign link, have amplified and led to a more procyclical reaction uh, to crisis rather than an insurance. So those are the two main uh, aspects I'm concentrating on. Uh, of course, there are other things that also need fixing, and they are, however, not in focus uh, right here, nor were they in focus so much uh, in the, in the uh, paper I'm talking about, except for one, the third one, which is an inefficient and politically divisive approach to maintaining fiscal discipline. This is something we do approach in that paper. Um, and the, the point there is that the way that the fiscal rules have been formulated um, is, uh, W uh, is error prone and that there would be better ways of achieving the, uh, the purpose. Um, so this was the original publication from the beginning of this year and uh, the, it has been uh, increasingly being called seven plus seven equals uh, hopefully more than uh, 14. Um, and in fact, I'm putting this here because the continuation of this project uh, at CPR, which we are just announcing, is, is going to be seven plus seven plus seven plus seven, so a much, much bigger circle and is particularly also not a circle right here. This paper had the characteristic of being seven French and seven uh, German economists. This was very much driven by the idea uh, about a year ago that there was a window of opportunity that was, uh, was opening uh, through um, uh, the, the, the French-German axis. Um, yeah, just for full disclosure, I'm, I'm neither French nor German, but I did count as a German uh, civil servant at the time. Um, so, what is the core message? I'm going to be brief on this because I assume that uh, a lot of it is already known and just focus on a few points which have more to do with the private risk sharing. So the core message was uh, we actually need two things and we actually need both. We need both more and better risk sharing but also 
a greater role for market discipline. And let me start from the second part. What does it mean, market discipline? How, how uh, what, what is it, uh, why this? Well, on the one hand side, uh, it is to make the, a, a, a no bailout clause more credible in the following sense that both it would actually make restructuring of, of uh, sovereign debt less costly when it actually is needed, but even more importantly, reduce the probability that such restructuring is needed. For this, it needs, in order to make it less costly, what you need is to break the doom loop. So the home buyers in the financial system, that's mostly the banking system, uh, needs, to be, needs to be reduced and um, the, the, uh, the, the, diabolic, um, the diabolic dynamics there um, reduced. And on the other hand, to going to the top, uh, we, we, need, we proposed a, quite a number of different uh, risk sharing instruments uh, from the deposit insurance, a common uh, um, deposit insurance for the euro area, to liquidity lines uh, pre uh, for pre-qualified countries through the ESM, and a uh, safe asset based on a diversified sovereign portfolio. We did not uh, specify exactly what kind of, uh, what type of, uh, of um, design this uh, could be, because there are several possible uh, design that, that fulfill uh, the requirements of providing a safe asset. Now, one that is something that is important to me is when we say we need both. This is not only a, um, a this is not just for you know political reasons. It's, you know sometimes you say okay, you have on the one hand side, uh, I want. Uh, I want this and you want that, and okay, let's meet in the middle. Um, uh, let's have, uh, let's agree on having both. That would be one approach of understanding this. The Germans want market discipline. Uh, the the French want risk sharing. Okay, let's do. Let's make a package in which we put them together. This is this is one possible interpretation, but it is not the spirit in which uh, these proposals were made. And I also think it's not the deeper the deeper um, analytical reason why you need this. It's not just a political project. This is really an economic project. Uh, and it has to do with complementarities. I mean, some of um, uh, the previous speakers already talked about important complementarities. Um, so here is, here is uh, uh, the, the, the reason why you know you want um, both is because you can reduce the probability of crisis. Let, let's take the, the first one. Well, yes, you can reduce the probability of crisis if you have more uh, stabilization tools against shocks. Sm uh, small, medium, large, we can discuss about that. And if you provide larger liquidity buffers wherever they are sitting for the protection both of innocent bystanders and for the protection against runs, then you reduce the probability of crisis. But you also re reduce the probability of crisis if uh, sovereign risk is better priced because there is actually a mechanism that allows markets to calculate sovereign risk and to understand when uh, debt restructuring is a probability and to price this in good times, not only uh, in bad times. And similarly, for, for arguments you can make for the banking side. You know, disincentives for concentration and for high home buyers in banks is one way is to say this is increasing market discipline, but it's also, uh, it is also a preventive instrument in order to reduce the probability of crisis. And that's, that's very much um, the spirit in which these, these proposals were made, and this is why there is an important plus there. So, you know, disincentives for concentration in, uh, uh, in sovereign, uh, in, of sovereign risk in banks, plus a safe asset in which you, where, when there is actually a run, in which you, in which you can run into. So th that combination is very different from just the question, if you just have uh, implement by regulatory means higher, um, higher penalties for home buyers. So, so let me get to the discussion. So th this, was, this was the proposal and then a large, large uh, debate ensured at least in the academic space, but also in the policy space. And uh, we then decided that it would be important that this debate could be uh, also made public and could be seen by a larger uh, uh, public. And what uh, uh, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, who is here, and Jean Pisani-Ferry agreed was to do a, um, a moderation of a policy debate which is uh, 
which, which you can look into in the um, Vox EU. It's called, it's the CEPR's policy um, uh, portal. And by now, I think there are about 20 contributions of different types of criticisms or people that are engaging with different proposals and are, um, and are uh, discussing them, disagreeing, and uh, making different uh, alternative uh, proposals. So let me um, put this, this, the debate in some categories. Uh, these, are t these are stylized types. Uh, they are not necessarily, uh, you cannot exactly put names on them, but they are stylized types. There, there is a type of people who, I mean, basically they agree with the, uh, with the assessment in principle, yes, need both to reconcile risk sharing and market discipline. But uh, we would also need other things. We need also other European public goods. We need uh, also uh, structural reforms. And maybe we need a special form of, uh, type of um, safe assets. Some people dis disagree very strongly with the SPs and uh, want others. So these are, these are very, uh, you know, these productive types of debates in the sense that, you know, what is the design and what are the additional things that one would like to have that may also be complements to, uh, to what, what we are proposing here. Then there is the type uh, A, what I call the type A uh, disagree. Um, critic, critics who disagree uh, from type A, and uh, they essentially they take issue with the fact that the risk sharing elements in our proposals are not uh, enough. Right? They say we need much, much more fiscal stabilization. And that ranges from saying, oh, we, we need a real capacity to borrow, real meaning big, uh, to uh, um, actually we need a real budget at the federal level. So the idea, you know, something, the uh, euro area should more, look more like the US. Or, you know, we need real, really much, much more stabilization tools. That's, that's one type of criticism. And similarly, on the financial side, um, there, are, there are those critis, critics who say, well, you know, you, you really need euro bonds of joint and several and anything uh, be, below that uh, threshold, anything that respects any kind of red lines of non-mutualization will not do it. And, uh, and uh, therefore, you know, um, don't even try to go for something that is, uh, that is uh, more um, uh, light touch. Then there is the other, the other extreme um, of uh, also the, the type C, I call them here, uh, types of disagreement. Um, and this is um, those who really take issue with this market discipline. Uh, basically, there is very often a principled uh, opposition against debt restructuring, and that may be principles in the sense that, uh, you know, the sovereign signature has to have value, or there cannot be doubts about the sovereign signature. Um, there is the, or there is the view that any type of debt restructuring mechanism, however you make it, is always, always going to be destabilizing. No matter under what circumstances, if you tell markets essentially that there is risk in sovereign debt, so if they didn't know that already, then they will, in the moment that you do actually in, uh, put in place something that is a, a restructuring mechanism, they will run. Um, and, and I think associated with that kind of perspective is also that the markets um, are almost always mispricing. So there is a deep, a deep uh, view that market uh, discipline cannot work because markets cannot work. And somehow people seem, tend to think that in sovereign debt this is particularly the case, but they do, and I think that's important to see, they do say so based on today's, on today's uh, framework, on a framework in which in fact there is it is not clear how to price sovereign risk because it's not clear, you know, when there, there will be uh, restructuring and when there will not be. So it is actually uh, hard to blame markets for not knowing this if the public sector is not telling them. Um, then on banking, well, the, the, here the principled opposition is this, which says basically, well, uh, banks, national banks are needed, are needed as safety valves. And... Uh, and I, and I think the interpretation by, behind this might be that essentially in crisis times you cannot count on the rest. <laughs> you cannot count on the European level, you cannot count on, the, on your partners, and you have to run home. 
Um, and of course, this is exactly what we saw in the last crisis. And therefore, you know, when banks, national banks, banking system did play this, uh, this, 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 this buffer. Um, so, so the view here is, okay, we need them. We still need them. Um, and no, actually, the principal view is we will always need them. The type B disagreements are a bit more in between, and I call them is a conditionally. They say, you know, market discipline is conditionally counterproductive and conditional essentially on, on, on where we are now, on the initial conditions. So, you know, it is destabilizing if you are at high debt, you know, Deauville type. Uh, if you're already at high debt, and then you tell them, well, uh, tell markets, by the way, tomorrow we're going to restructure you. Of course, they will run today. Um, and similarly, uh, for banking, well, you know, may, may need to, um, may need to, may need them as uh, safety valves given the limitations of, something dropped off there, given the limitations of today's system or the, the, uh, the, the, the not believing that, that the system will really uh, provide the insurance. So, so, of course, a lot of this, especially the conditional part, you know, and for high debt countries, sounds like Italy. And, um, you know, I, uh, I did, uh, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, fresh here, but I, I'm, I'm quoting somebody who is, uh, who is a comedian in, uh, in Italy, and he was, uh, he was, uh, um, you know, last week he was making uh, an argument about, you know, you should not, when you are one step from the abyss or from the edge, you should not be making uh, um, stupid things with a shoe. Um, so, um, so, but, you know, taking that more seriously, one more time is, you know, saying take legacy debt seriously. And I think that is absolutely valid. Uh, valid, uh, valid. So you know, we cannot just pretend that we are not where we are. And, uh, and just by saying you know, we should never have gotten here and you know, Italy shouldn't have such high debt, it's not going to make it go away. So, um, so I think this is, this, is, this is where it is valid. One has to, has to think about solutions that take into account countries that are in a vulnerable situation now. Now, of course, Italy is also special because it is, uh, it is actually, you know, making interesting uh, little uh, steps uh, close to the edge. Um, so now, as a, as a last point, so the, the Euro debate page and, the, and it's, uh, you know, it has, has, has worked very well. It's, it, it, is, it is an ongoing effort to, to collect uh, and I hope it will continue to be something that is a, uh, a place where we find not only criticism of existing proposals, but also the source of new proposals. Um, Jean Pisani Ferry uh, did a, something which is a kind of um, preliminary um, roundup of the discussion. And uh, it's, uh, it's recently, and I, I recommend uh, looking at it if you haven't seen it, recently published also uh, on VoxEU, an anatomy of the debate. And I take from him an, an, a last uh, point. So his starting point is, you know, he's asking this question, why is it so difficult to agree? Um, is it because there is a battle of interest or is it a battle of ideas? Now, the interest theory is interesting. Huh? Um, well, the interest theory, but it's also in a way analytically quite simple. Uh, so if you may imagine the interest idea, uh, um, Interest theory is, oh, there are two camps in the euro area and they have different interests. Let's call them debtors and creditors. And, you know, one, some want one thing, the other want the other thing. And uh, so, okay, it, then there is a natural place where they might meet, you know, let's do 50-50 or let's have, a, let's have some kind of a, of, of, of a game theoretic solution to that. Maybe it's, you know, some kind of cooperation that we find through tit for tat repeatedly, but it is kind of a tractable, um, a tractable uh, problem. What is more difficult is if actually this is, uh, if this is a battle of ideas. What if, you know, the actual, the, the disagreement is that underlying uh, different positions are different explicit and implicit, more importantly, implicit models of the world. Um, so these are harder to solve, especially if they are implicit, because then ideas become very close to ideologies, and uh, you know, battles of ideologies often end in bloody ways. Um, so here, as a last slide, I want you to 
meet the Vibrio cholerae, that's right. It's the bacterium that transmits cholera. It looks very beautiful, but it's actually quite uh, nasty. And the question is how to contain it, or the question was for many decades was how to contain it, and there was a battle of ideas here. There were two camps, two schools, and one camp was saying, okay, you need to isolate infected, um, infected populations, and you need to put them under quarantine. And the other one, that's the contagionist, and the other one was saying, no, you need to, Im to improve, you have to you know, make your homework and uh, clean in front of your door, you have to uh, improve the local hygienic conditions, and that will do it. And for many, many uh, uh, summits, one of the other, these experts met, and they could not agree on a treatment, and on an international, it was clear that this, this was a, a case for, a, for an international common to agree on a, on a way to deal with a, an outbreak, and um, they could not agree. They would sometimes agree on a, on a, uh, on a, um, a, a quarantine, but which was not long enough, so it wasn't effective, so it wasn't implemented. Sounds familiar? Um, so at, at some stage, you know, um, this, this, this battle was actually resolved, but the point is, you know, implicit ideas here about what the actual model of the infection is were actually very important and prevented for a long time the resolution. Um, this one was actually resolved in the end uh, through the you know, recognition that the infection pattern is the local hygiene, and this is the way that we are mostly treating cholera outbreaks uh, these days. But, uh, but the point that I want to make, back, going back to our problem at hand, is that uh, implicit, implicit models, um, and, and, and I, I am afraid that they have been reinforced over the last years. So. Implicit, even national models of seeing the world and that turn into ideologies become a big, big, uh, a big, big obstacle for agreeing and, the, and, the, and for finding solutions. And the solution, of course, has to be going back to understanding the explicit model, to, to looking at the data and agreeing on how, actually, what, what is the better de uh, description of the world. And that, uh, with that, I hope that we can continue to um, provide some contribution. Thank you. All right, thank you, and uh, also thank you for mentioning uh, the cholera at the end. So that's, that's a very nice metaphor to, to think further about um, how we, I guess, uh, move forward. Um, so um, we have two discussants, Laurence Boone and then Paul, Paul de Graube. Laurence, please. Thanks. Uh, a big thank you to the organizer for having this session, which is ultra interesting, since it, evol it involves also a deep dive into medicine, which uh, is quite unexpected, but I guess well deserved. Um, so in the 10 minutes, I will skip through some of the parts of the presentation to focus on three points. The first one, and I think Beatrice uh, and Emmanuel both alluded to, is the description of the 7 plus 7 is really a long-term objective but in my view, there is one thing missing, which is the transition to the long-term objective and perhaps the sequencing on which there could be a little more detail. Um, and there is one thing in particular, uh, and Beatrice alluded to at the end, which, which is crucial, is how do we deal with the legacy bank debt when we have both DBRD and the state aid and it is something that perhaps was not envisaged at the time it was put in place. So that's the second thing. And the third one has to do with the fiscal capacity. And here I have to thank Mahmoud for skipping it um, so that I can have <laughs> a bit of a look at it. But I would also like to talk about governance of it, which is a subject which, uh, again, is a little dealt with. And yet it is crucial when you talk about these issues, uh, especially if we want the battle of, uh, I don't know actually which one is best interest of ideas from your picture. But anyway, if we want some kind of convergence, I think we need to talk about governance. So let me, uh, let me perhaps start with the sequencing and, <coughs> and go directly here. Um, one thing which 
you know, looking at the presentation, which, one thing which was very striking to me is we talk about concentration of safe asset, we talk about doom loop, in essence, and we talk about the, sorry, the absence of safe asset, the concentration of the sovereign domestic bonds and the doom loop. But, and this is something that Mahmoud's presentation showed, it's not so different in the US. The reason why we talk about it in Europe, it's because we have one common currency and still several fiscal authorities and no common fiscal capacity. So I, my first question when looking at the presentation is aren't we <clears throat> trying not to address the question of the buyer of last resort with some mechanism which goes around the question without properly uh, addressing the question. And what you see here is the um, uh, sovereign bond in banks portfolio, but I also looked at the US part of sovereign bond in their assets for the bank, and it's 14%. You can compare that with 10% for Italy and less than 4 for the euro area on average. So the first question is that it's aren't we properly trying to avoid the question of, of buyer of last resort? Um, the second question is here, when we talk about safe assets, I think that's perhaps where I have both a disagreement of, of idea and interest. Um, it's always been very difficult for market to be linear and assess risk properly. And I am not sure that clarifying, especially now <clears throat> in the transition period, what we mean by sovereign debt restructuring is helpful. Uh, and once again, uh, all the safe assets that we have described, they usually suppose that there is a decorrelation between the junior trench and the senior trench. My past life as an investor tells me that in a crisis, this decorrelation is a challenge and that something Gautram alluded to in his introduction, if the public sector doesn't feel confident enough in the scheme to actually share some risk through the taxpayer, why would the private sector pay it? And if it's the private sector, then they take the junior trench. It's usually not long-term investors, but it will be short-term hedge fund. And we know that in time of crisis, they are more volatile. So to me, this is quite orthogonal to the fact that we can have um, some safe assets uh, with some sovereign debt restructuring that have a junior trench. <coughs> the, sorry, the other point on this is about the legacy uh, NPL. And I know it's been said before, but I think it hasn't been said for a while, which is why I would like to insist on it. The way that some countries before the bank, the, the BRRD, dealt with NPL was by setting up asset management company, if I oversimplify, buying the NPL at a cheap price with some implicit subsidies of the government and then being able to sell them at a higher price later on. Now, we haven't done this for some of the countries. Um, and there's a very good paper, by the way, from Cass and Pereza from the co commission on this. The, su the success would in part the subsidy that you give to the asset management company when you buy the MPL at a cheap price. Either you buy it at a cheap price and you compensate the bank, or you help, but you, but you have in a way to make it for them if you want them to unload it. It will be cheaper for a bank to keep bad NPL than having to sell them at a very low price. Um, so we should get inspiration from Ireland and Portugal when we look at, uh, in Spain, sorry, when we look at other countries. And perhaps we should, in this transition period, where we know that we have some orthogonality between the BRD and the state aid rule of, of Europe, allow a period of three, four, five years for which some banks can deal with the NPL and in exceptional circumstances, which by the way uh, is allowed within the EU rule, allow to offload the NPL with some state subsidies and go around this issue. So that is the second point I wanted to make. Let me now go to um, the fiscal stabilization capacity. Um, there is some kind of discrepancy between international organizations, I would say, who have the same type of fiscal scheme, 
Uh, and they think that they address, and when I say they, I include the IMF and the OECD, that they address the moral hazard issue uh, because they have a cap and because they have some compliance with fiscal rule condition. And they also think that they address the issue of permanent transfer because it's a counter-cyclical fiscal stabilization tool. And in effect, in the simulation, and I will show that, they do, they are not permanent transfer. But the fact that it's still considered incompatible by, I would say, half of the seven plus seven. So it's something where I think it would be interesting to have your view. And I think part of it has to do with the governance of such schemes. So let me just skip quickly um, to, sorry, just remind you of the principle that you will find equivalently in the IMF and the OECD. There is an automatic trigger that's essential and it's to avoid a, an endless debate, I guess, uh, partly with the Eurogroup and I'll come back to the governance. And usually it is that the unemployment rate is increasing and is well above the past five, six or seven years uh, long average. The second thing is that the support is proportional to the size of the shock and you can dispute whether it's a half as in the case of the IMF or it's a full percentage point as in the case of the OECD, but there is um, this, this support. And then we put a cap so that they cannot be permanent on transfer. Uh, and here at the OECD we put it at 5%. I think the IMF just a to a cap without giving one. And also one of the uh, common features you will find is that the contribution are ex ante very small, and it is shown that even with small indebtedness, you can address most of the past shock. So all in all, it looks to satisfy all the arguments. Um, and obviously you have to comply with the EU fiscal rule to be able to benefit from it. So with this simulation, what you see that what's, what is nice is effectively every single country or nearly in the Eurozone would have benefited from it. And just for the sake of it, I pointed out to the people in my team that if compliance with fiscal rule was a condition, then surely Germany in 2003, 2004 would not have benefited from it. But yet in the simulation it could, and that's for the, the beauty of the simulation is that you can see effectively each country uh, will have contributed, and when we, because of the cap, it's not a permanent transfer, it reverses nicely to zero. Now, I think one of the key issues which is not addressed when we deal with this, and which was partly addressed Friday and this morning, a Friday by the Anseatic League, and this morning by a NOPED from um, uh, a German group of people in the Handelsblatt, uh, is the governance. Because there is, and this is something I haven't heard um, on, on, in this place being discussed, there is also a discussion about whether this should be an intergovernmental tool which stays within the ESM and which has therefore little parliamentary control uh, and which will always be uh, dependent on the vote of some key countries or whether this should be moved to the European Commission and make it accountable to a chamber of the European Parliament so that it also becomes the expression of a democratic choice. Um, because at the end of the day, on top of completing and uh, lightening the burden for the ECB, a fiscal capacity is also a way of expressing a democratic choice that the EU is lacking. So before Guntram tells me to stop, uh, and I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, place um, and allow me to discuss issues that relate to risk insurance, and I will add stabilization. Let me also note that there are two types of speakers in this panel. You have the 20-minute speakers and the 10-minute speakers. I belong to the, 10, the group of 10-minute speakers, but I will not complain. Uh, I can make my point in 10 minutes. So let me try at least. <laughs> Okay, I, it would, was not my choice, the 10 no, minutes. No, no, no. <laughs> um, what I want to do is to 
ask the question, what, what kind of risks have we had um, in the Eurozone since we started? And a good way to start is to show the business cycle component of, of GDP um, in, in the Eurozone, right? This is basically the output gap also, right? You just take out a trend from GDP and, and here you have it, right? And the surprising thing about this is that there is so much correlation in uh, the cyclical component of, of the output gap, right? So very little asymmetry in the correlation. The asymmetry is in the amplitude. Some countries experience a, when they have a boom, a, a terrible boom, and when they have a crash, a very bad crash, and others have much less amplitude, right? So it's booms and busts what we have experienced in the Eurozone. The old fashioned booms and busts that capitalism is um, endemic with. And, and that has been, um, in fact, one of the problems. The monetary union has great difficulties in dealing with this kind of booms, bust scenarios for two reasons. One is that during the boom, we, we have seen that large divergences in competitive positions and external balances arise. And during the downturn, the downturn reveals the instability of the government bond markets, right? Uh, during the downswing. And, 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 and that creates a very special type of risk, and I will call a tail risk, right? Um, and, and it has its origin in the fragility of the government bond markets in the absence of a backstop in, in a monetary union like the Eurozone, right? Uh, when, when governments have to issue debt in a currency which is de facto a foreign currency like Argentina does when it issues debt in dollars. And therefore, it's very much subject to um, movements of distrust and self-fulfilling crisis that we have seen um, and that lead to large and destabilizing capital flows during downturns, right? So this will come back. There's no doubt about this. When there was a, a major downturn in economic activity, markets will look at where are the weaker governments and where are the stronger governments. Let's pull out from the weak governments and go into the strong governments, creating um, sudden stops and then misery for the, those who are selected on the wrong side uh, because they then, during a recession, have to stop um, trying to stabilize and, and they have to uh, impose immediate austerity uh, because that's what markets tell them to do at that moment. So these are tail risks, right? That's the major risk that we face in, in, in the Eurozone. Now, what's the role of financial markets here? Well, we have to accept that financial markets do not provide good insurance against tail risks. They are very good and efficient in insuring against normally distributed risks. Right? But when tail risks occur, then they run away. Um, panic, and, and in doing so, they amplify the risks. Right? That's why I think that the Capital Markets Union, while an interesting idea from an efficiency point of view, yeah, you want to have a bigger um, market that allow also startups and what have you to, to, to start new initiatives, but will do nothing to deal with these tail risks. On the contrary, it might even make them worse because it's more integrated and therefore the, um, the tendency to run away during a crisis will probably be easier. In fact, these people will run faster in the capital market union, right? So thereby potentially make it, making it worse. So that's the, that's the problem of financial markets that we, we face and of the capital markets union. So therefore, I come to the, the, the conclusion that tail risk can only be insured by governments, right? Um, governments that have the capacity to, to tax are, are those who are capable of, of uh, insurance against these tail risks. Who are these uh, in, in the monetary union? Well, you have the national governments. In principle, national governments could do it, right? But um, my argument has been that when you are hit in a recession by this um, pressure from financial markets that lead to sudden stops in particular countries, then these governments lose all capacity to insure. Right? They, they have to do the opposite of insuring. They have to amplify uh, the shock. So government, national governments 
in a monetary union cannot do it. If they were not in a monetary union, they could do it. But being in a monetary union makes it very difficult for a large number of them to do this kind of um, insurance, smoothing over time, in fact. That's what I have in mind here. The ECB, of course, is there, the major insurance of liquidity risks, and, and, and it has certainly done so during the crisis of 2010, 2012, when it started its OMT program. But, as you know, it has attached stiff conditionality to its use, thereby handicapping its use in the future and creating credibility. Uh, will the ECB use it next time? And it's unclear whether the ECB will use it next time. We don't know that. Maybe it will, maybe it will not. But uh, given the conditionality attached to all this, it's not obvious that this will be used. Right? Recent proposals that have been made, just to say a few things about the unemployment insurance system that has been discussed also earlier. Uh, I don't think, given the, 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 the size of these um, common unemployment insurance mechanisms, will not deal with tail risks either because they are too small, but the way I would see it is as a first step towards a budgetary union, which I believe is the only mechanism that can deal with these tail risks, right? And, and budgetary union does include consolidation of national public debts because that's the source of the, um, the, the systemic risk that arises each time we will have a recession. Let me conclude by saying a few things about the, the whole literature that, that we have been um, overviewing today and that is very important. Uh, it has very much been influenced by modern macroeconomics, DSGE, but also in a way by OCA theory, right? Where you take the view that shocks are exogenous, right? It's like meteors that hit you, right? Um, there's nothing you can do about these shocks, right? They are there, right? So the only thing we should try to do is to to, to smoothen it, to do some insurance, right, uh, across countries and possibly over time, right? Um, but that's not what reality is. Reality is about booms and busts um, that uh, I think are endemic in, in capitalism. They are produced by endogenous movements in market sentiments, call them animal spirits, and very little to do with exogenous shocks, right? Um, and, and, and therefore, not only insurance matters, but also stabilization. We have we have to, to do something. The, 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 we have to stabilize the system. It's an unstable system. So we better try to stabilize it. The problem of the Eurozone has been, I think, that the capacity of national governments to do that, to stabilize an otherwise unstable system, right, has been very much eroded uh, without creating a capacity to do it at the level of the Eurozone. Only the ECB has some capacity to stabilize, but we cannot put all the burden of stabilization onto the ECB. And therefore, I do think that uh, to survive, the Eurozone will have to set really ambitious uh, systems of, of stabilization, right? not, not very small things. We hear a lot in, in, in here in Brussels in particular that where you you trigger a little bit uh, at, at, at some technical features, and, and that will do the trick. No, it will have to be something ambitious in order for the Eurozone to survive. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, thank you, Paul, and apologies again for the 10 minutes, but I think your messages were very clear. Um, so. So perhaps next time all of us should have 10 minutes and then uh, we have more time for debates. So that, uh, that would be actually good. Well, we have time for uh, questions and so on from the audience. But of course, also among you, if you want to react to each other, you tell me. And I, of course, also have ideas and questions that I would like to raise. But let's perhaps start taking a few. Paul Tucker and then uh, Martin Helwig. Thank you. I, I had a question for Emmanuel, which actually links with um, where Paul ended up. Um, Emmanuel, in your, in your fantastic, marvelous presentation, which starts to put some rigor behind what people have been saying for a long time, you had a, a table which showed that with risk sharing, um, we could undo 66% of the damage, and without it, local fiscal policy could do 55%. And my immediate response to that was, was to ask you to persuade us that that's a big difference rather than a, um, a small um, difference. It kind of reminds me a bit of those models where you get a welfare wedge and when you think about 
whether it's kind of a big thing or not, it, it might actually be small. But, but more importantly, when I reflected on it and I thought, but the big thing isn't your central estimate of these numbers. It's, it's is one of the, your tools um, more robust than the other of the, of the tools? And this goes a bit to what Beatrice was saying about interests versus ideas. I mean, up to a point, ideas frame our conception of, of interests. And it's not obvious to me that policymakers in the euro area have either frightened elected policymakers enough um, about the fragility of the euro area, nor given them a sufficiently articulated sense of what the advantages are for the European continent as a whole, were the monetary union to have firm foundations. And what I really, what I, it's not just the economics, I kind of love that Emmanuel's putting numbers on this, but 65, 66 versus 55 didn't sound that great, but then if local fiscal policy is constrained, does it become an enormous difference? And is your story, in fact, much more um, potent and, and therefore laying the grounds for frightening the elected political leaders to the degree to which um, I think they need to be frightened? I'm a bit concerned about the focus on risk and financial flows, and also about the basically static one-shot approach to this. If I ask myself what have been the real shocks, uh, if I look at this country, I would say the things that happened to Wallonie. If I look at Germany, the things that happened in the Neue Länder, deindustrialization, in the Saar and the Ruhr area, if I look at the UK, again, deindustrialization in uh, the north of England and Wales, and so on. Now, key features of all of those developments is they involve changes in comparative advantage that last. It's not just a one-time shock, and next period we play a new game. Second, after a short while, it's clear that this is not an insurance problem, but an adjustment problem. And the political economy typically uh, harms the ability uh, to adjust. In the case of Greece, one might say that the shock already came in the 1890s with changing comparative advantage uh, in the markets for certain fruit. Uh, which completely changed uh, the economics of this. Now, in some federal states, the major equalization and stabilization mechanism is not actually financial, but is public spending. Like the Swiss military has, as its major purpose, fiscal equalization across cantons. In the case of Germany, where there is fiscal equalization, the empirical research that has been done has suggested that in the case of the Za area or uh, the uh, Ruhr area, it has tended to retar retard the ability to adjust. So uh, the problem I have is that this discussion seems to be taking the one observation we have, namely the crisis of the past 10 years, and to be generalizing from that, without considering the underlying economic forces that make the adjustment uh, so slow and so difficult. Yes, so thank you for very interesting presentations. Um, I, I must say I, I agree with Paul that uh, we have to think big in terms of uh, uh, preventing uh, some of these uh, big shocks that uh, have hit us and are going to, to hit us. Uh, now, fiscal union is, of course, politically extremely complicated. Uh, but what about this idea of, that was put forward by uh, Kashyap, Prajan, and Stein about capital insurance for banks? Banks can be extremely dangerous to the, to the economy. Now, of course, to avoid moral hazard, you need to make it uh, contingent on things that happen beyond the control of banks. But uh, as you saw, as you showed, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of correlation in the macroeconomic cycles, even though their amplitude differs. But uh, we all believe in uh, 
automatic stabilizers for fiscal policy? What about uh, much more uh, uh, ambitious uh, automatic stabilizers for, uh, for the banking sectors? Let's face it, the counter-cyclical capital buffer is uh, really, really not uh, used a lot, and that's an understatement. So shouldn't we uh, stabilize the system in at least contribute to stabilizing the system in, in this way? Yes, my question is uh, mostly for, for Mahmoud, but it's for anyone else. And, and it's related with the effectiveness of the uh, private risk sharing through capital markets and the credit channel that you uh, presented the accounting effect of these several components of uh, risk sharing. And uh, uh, the point is that uh, um, in a recessionary period, the credit channel practically disappears, as it is shown in uh, uh, IMF working paper by Fourseri and, uh, uh, and others. And also, uh, never it is measured what will be the effectiveness of these flows that are just counted in an accounting terms as smoothing the cycle in the territory that gets those flows. But if we think about the uh, flows coming from financial assets, securities, those, uh, uh, those flows, that income goes for part of the population with a very uh, small uh, consumption propensity. So never the effect on the economic activity of the country or region receiving those flows is indeed measured in his analysis, which are mostly a accounting uh, way of saying, well, there is some income coming from the outside the world, and that is equivalent to smooth the GDP evolution in the region that receives those flows, which is not entirely true, and particularly, as Paul underlined, in a recessionary period. So that puts some limits, in my view, to uh, the uh, potential of uh, uh, private risk sharing through those channels to be very effective in those periods. OK, we have four questions. Uh, let me get one more, uh, Gabriele Giudice. And then, uh, then I think I will add one, and then we are done. Then each of us has one minute or two minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm Gabriele Giudice from the Commission. Uh, first of all, just to make a comment that uh, indeed it's important to have a fiscal stabilization capacity and the Commission has come forward with a proposal which is quite similar to the one mentioned by uh, Mahmoud de Laurence. Um, but I would like to actually ask a question to Paul de Gros because he made a very interesting analysis of the fact that there is these tail risks in the system. Uh, I think they were come from these capital flows which you highlighted, and in fact probably they also justify the difference in amplitude uh, uh, in the cycle across countries, given that it is a small countries which are receiving such a big inflow of money big time uh, in good times, and therefore you know, it's a more uh, stronger impact on the economy. I'm just a bit surprised that you, know, you identify these tail risks, which is this movement of capital flows, but then you jump to a conclusion, which is my view is to some extent disconnected from that. Of course, uh, as I said, we also like a fiscal stabilization instrument, but still it seems to me that the tail risk is related to the fact that there is a distribution in the balance sheets of the banking system of different debt uh, which is, let's say, the, 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 the basis we've seen before, the domestic bias is basically for the function of these, uh, the national banking systems. So you just jump to the conclusion of having a budget, uh, let's say, European budget or, you know, fiscal union, but you don't mention at all the fact that there, there is probably one other solution which has been mentioned before by, by Beatrice about having a safe asset at European level, we actually would eliminate this tail risk in the first place if it is becoming the asset of reference for the whole banking system. Therefore, these capital flows would just disappear. So rather than dealing with the absorption element of resilience, I think it would be better to deal with the vulnerability element of resilience. So reduce vulnerability in the first place, which is amplifying the shocks. Uh, 
So I would like to see, and see what you also consider that as a part of your construction or you just bypass it altogether. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think this is a lot of material. Um, pr perhaps let me uh, add to uh, perhaps Beatrice um, to get you also to reply to some of the comments that Paul uh, de Gauwe was making, uh, perhaps um, especially on this point of, um, you know, do you, do, does your proposal actually cover the, the big risks? Because um, it seems to me the, um, to a large extent, your, your uh, paper um, sort of seems to be saying, well, if we come to the limit, we do some sort of a debt restructuring, but don't worry about it, it's not gonna be very bad, right? So we're just doing it and it's not a big thing, right? And so uh, the economic literature seems to suggest the exact opposite. I mean, um, market exclusion for several years after a major debt restructuring, um, which means cuts in, you know, services that you can provide and so on. So, so isn't there, isn't there a gap in your framework? It seems to me the framework is too much based on hoping that a real debt restructuring won't be that bad, but perhaps I mis misread that, um, uh, and that's why I, I would like you to react to that point as well. Um, perhaps we go uh, again in, um, in the same order as, um, as, uh, as we were speaking uh, first. So, so Emmanuel, if you want to start. Yeah, let me take uh, a few of the questions. The first one by Paul. So I showed these numbers, which were doing a horse race between risk sharing and some other instruments, for example, budget deficits or government spending. And in particular, I showed that in the Eurozone under realistic conditions, uh, optimal risk sharing gets you to 66% towards the first best, and let's say fiscal, uh, running deficits gets you 55% towards the first best. So first, it's showing that optimal risk sharing is about as important as domestic fiscal policy, which we all take to be very important. So that already kills the argument that optimal risk sharing is not an important thing. The second thing is that these gains can be accumulated. So if you do optimal national fiscal policy, everything you can do by yourself, you get to 55%. That leaves 45%, which can be pretty big if the, if the shock is really large. And you can get 66% of this 45% by having optimal risk sharing. So it's like you have a disease and you have two pills and the two pills are equally powerful and if you accumulate them, you almost cure the disease. That's the right way to, uh, to interpret it. So it was very much conveying the idea that it's a big deal. Uh, then I want to take uh, uh, Martin's question, which is about uh, other shocks and perhaps shocks that don't have to do with financial crisis, but slower moving shocks like disindustrialization uh, and everything. And I think these permanent shocks are also things that could be smooth to some extent. And uh, there's always gonna be a trade-off between insurance and adjustment in the sense that if you provide some insurance, you will slow down the adjustment, but you will make it less painful as well. And so I don't think that negates uh, the whole approach. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to say that uh, there's this question of big tail risks versus more normal risks. And I think it's probably true that some risks are just very hard to foresee and very hard to insure against uh, ex ante. And so we'll all need, always need some kind of public fiscal capacity uh, to deal with those very extreme shocks. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start with, I'll, I'll, I have comments on three questions, but I'll start with Beto's question, which uh, he at least directed partly towards me. Uh, Beto, I completely agree, and I, I think to summarize that, I would just say, look, private risk sharing, I don't think is a substitute for national fiscal policy, and it's not actually a substitute for what I pointed to and Lawrence spent more time explaining with a common fiscal capacity. Right? I don't think private risk sharing is, is it, I think I agree with Paul de Graaf, it's really about efficient capital markets. It's not gonna address the, the tail risks of, that I'll come back to that you're talking about. Uh, secondly, on, on, on Martin's point, I think it raises a little bit more of a fundamental question about what the Eurozone is. 
when countries are going through long-term structural changes or changes in comparative advantage, and, and in the Eurozone, we sometimes characterize this as uh, differences, significant differences in labor markets, which give rise to very different productivity levels, et cetera, and that give you differences in competitiveness. Those in the current construct of the Eurozone are largely, by definition, national responsibilities to address. I don't think they come into the Eurozone at, at the Euro area level. I agree with uh, Emmanuel that the, the, some Eurozone capacities, like a fiscal capacity, may actually help. But I think the structural underlying adjustment is still a national responsibility, and it's hard to see how you take that away. Okay? You can cushion it. Uh, I have one comment which uh, wasn't really part of a question, but I just want to spend uh, On debt restructuring, uh, Jeremy knows my views on the 7 plus 7. We've, uh, you know, uh, very supportive of much of the work there. I would just say that in the, when you look for any kind of automaticity in debt restructuring or it is very, very difficult. And here I would just say the IMF's experience of doing debt restructurings around the world or providing official assistance, it is very much a case-by-case -case basis. And if you, Beatrice, when you say high debt countries, can you really distinguish between the debt levels of Italy and the debt levels of Portugal? There are marginal differences. There's still pretty high debt levels, but Portugal seems to be making very good progress reducing them. When you go into the details, it really does matter countries' abilities to run primary surpluses, to, to improve their growth outlook. And the markets do respond very positively when they see favorable dynamics of debt-GDP ratios on the decline. They don't have to decline by a lot every year. So I think that is a problem. Uh, I completely agree with Paul de Graaf that, and I said this in a sort of small way, which is that what you describe as tail risk do need a kind of eurozone response and a central fiscal capacity or some kind of what you call budgetary unions that may be quite ambitious for at this stage is going to be an answer. It's not going to, you know, markets are not going to stick around. In, in the tail risk scenario, and the capital market union itself is not really, I don't think, designed to address that. Thank you. Um, so, debt restructurings are extremely disruptive. Um, you said um, this is almost always the case, and of, in fact. Uh, you know, we have a, a literature on that, and some of us have uh, spent uh, much time studying exactly these dynamics in emerging markets that, you know, sovereign debt restructuring seldom come alone. They come with banking crisis, and then they propagate into output crisis, and eventually you have a political crisis, too. That, at least, is a pattern that seems to be quite well established. But the question is, you know, why is this? Why, why do they have to be so um, disruptive? Um, do they need to? Has it maybe something to do with the way that we are organizing uh, sovereign debt markets right now, namely with the fact that there is a non-system, or in fact that you know the system that exists right there, the sovereign debt restructuring regime de facto is the IMF's uh, debt, uh, uh, sovereign debt sustainability analysis, and uh, that's the gatekeeper for saying. Um, what is sustainable and what is not. And in that case, uh, I can give the uh, question back to you, Mahmoud. What is it? Uh, the, what does the DSA say for Portugal or Italy? I mean, that's, that is the... the like <laughs> well, this is, this is de facto the, the regime right now. And therefore, and, and the other point, you know, when you're talking inside a monetary union, then there are all these complementary things, not complementary, I mean, absolutely important preconditions for making debt restructuring less costly. In fact, that is the proposal. The proposal is that it should not be as costly to have, if, 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 you don't, if your banking system is not under pressure when you restructure your sovereign debt, well, then the, one of the major transmission channels is already gone. And that is part of what you want to achieve uh, in a European monetary union. That, you know, namely, that risk is, is uh, shared across countries and it is not nationalized. Um, uh, regarding um, 
regarding uh, the other uh, the fiscal uh, side that, that you uh, mentioned, uh, Laurence, uh, well, actually, in the in the proposal of the seven plus seven, there is a proposal for a uh, unemployment uh, um, reinsurance uh, fund or insurance fund. What it does not have is a fiscal capacity. So it cannot borrow. It's a, it's a real insurance fund. It's pre-funded by countries, and when they when they need it, you know, based on certain triggers, they draw, and then it is replenished again. So in that sense, it is an insurance uh, fund, but it's not a it's not a a, uh, a uh, precursor to a European budget as as what what you would like, uh, Paul. Um, and that is also where the criticism comes from, from some sides who actually would like this insurance fund not to be an insurance fund, but really to be a possibility to, to act as a shock absorber by actually borrowing. And that, that is, that there is where uh, um, I think one of the differences lies and where one can be of different opinions in terms of how important this is. This goes back to you know, sort of your, your quantifications. And the last point I wanted to take up um, uh, Martin is, uh, is uh, you know, the, that there are bigger shocks and that they are secular and, uh, you know, deindustrialization, not only inside the monetary union, but in fact, you know, in many countries, uh, in many advanced countries, is certainly something that has, uh, has had a big impact, as we know not, now know, on the political economy of uh, countries. Um, no question. Uh, you know, within the within uh, Europe, we think that convergence and growth are actually very important uh, goals too, and the instruments to address those may not be sufficient. Uh, and in fact, they, but in fact, you know, that it may not be a question so much of the instruments at the central level, but rather of the adjustment. Uh, in that sense, I agree with you, but I don't see them as being a. I don't see that as being a, a argument not to do the things that uh, that need to, that you need to do in order to uh, get rid of the destabilizing of the highly destabilizing uh, effects on um, amplification effects that we have seen in the last crisis. I don't think that we already have enough uh, done enough to prevent that from happening again and from that being really a one-shot game that will never repeat. Um, I won't. I won't add much to what I was saying. Um, I think very flatly, and if we come to a pragmatic exercise before the capital market union may smooth uh, shocks, short-term shocks, to answer your question, because I think it's very different from the underlying structural trends that we are seeing. We will need a lot of time because one thing we haven't discussed is all the nitty gritty issues which are behind it, starting with the insolvency procedure, the judicial procedure, the format of the loans, how each national regulator is gold plating the European debt. So it would be interesting to complete the discussion we had by stepping down one level and look at how it actually works in practice. And the fact is, in practice, there is no European investor who feels that there is, there can be cross-border investment if only because of the insolvency law for loans, for example, which is not the case in the US, varies from one state to another. Because when there is a crisis, the national regulator will impose extra loans to prevent the flow of capital that you showed uh, in your presentation. So to, to the extent that the cycle could start slowing down, that there are a lot of things that we haven't solved relying on capital market union only, but I think that's something you, you were highlighting is irrealistic to address the next shock that we are going to see. Um, and for all we've said, the public sector will have to put his skin in it again. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And the second one, I just want to leave you with a sentence that I discovered during the crisis, which I liked, which was about uh, the divide between the US-UK appreciation and the European one. And I think it's somebody called Simon, but I forgot his surname, who said that the US and UK have always underestimated the political commitment of the European to the Euro. But the Euro area countries have underestimated the economic cost of this political commitment. And I think that's very true today. Um. Okay. Just a, a, f a few points. One, 
um, point relating to what Martin Helwig was, was saying. Yes, of course, these long-term adjustment problems, industrial adjustment problems are very important, but I would argue they have almost nothing to do with the Eurozone crisis. Right? The Eurozone crisis arose because in some countries you had excessive boom fueled by debt uh, and capital inflows that led uh, people to take on too much debt until the wake-up call and then uh, finding out uh, to have too much debt and having to deleverage. So that's the story that I have in mind about the Eurozone crisis. And I, I'm not saying that these other issues are not important, but I think they are quite orthogonal to, to the Eurozone crisis. I, I have sympathy with what Matthias is proposing, uh, some counter-cyclical capital policies right, for banks. Uh, so I'm all in favor of that. I, I do know and I do realize that the politics of that is difficult. I mean, you know even better than, than I do. Um, you have to take away the punch ball when the party, when everybody is partying, right? And, uh, and that creates um, political problems that uh, we, we face, I think, to implement this. But otherwise, I'm all in favor of this. And finally, then, on um, this gentleman from, from the commission, uh, so I'm, yeah, banking union is also key in, in solving this problem. I, will, I didn't talk about this, but uh, this was because of the 10 minute constraint. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I should have talked about it. It's no excuse not to talk about it. Um, but banks amplify these tail risks, right? But they don't eliminate them. And, and, uh, so we, we will still need a, a, a fiscal union. And in fact, a banking union requires a fiscal union. I cannot see a banking union without a fiscal backstop somewhere, right? And that can only be there if you have some kind of fiscal union. So the two are intertwined, and, uh, but I, I agree with you. I should have talked about the banking union. Okay, so please join me in thanking all the panelists, and we have a break now. <laughs>